attention to take out the well the card you find in the seat back in front of you. Please fill that out. Let us know that you're here. Also, if you have a prayer concern that you would like lifted by the current ministry of the church, please fill out the back side of that card. Put it in the offering later on during the service. Also, if you're a guest with us this morning, we'd like to give you a free gift from the church. There's some books out on the welcome stand. Please pick one of those up on your way out. It's a, it's a devotional uh, guide over some music and some songs. Just our gift to you saying thank you for checking us out this morning. So be sure to pick one of those up today as we leave this morning. Well, this week we are continuing our teaching series uh, titled The Way of Christ by looking at the story of David's anointing. And you may be wondering how we can talk about an Old Testament story if we're working through a Pentecost series. But the reality is, is that the Holy Spirit has been present throughout human history, throughout all of history. And while the day of Pentecost in the upper room with the disciples was the beginning of that age, that age of Pentecost, um, the, we live in that age, and we live in that age today. The Spirit of God, the living breath of God, the Holy Spirit has existed throughout time. And the Holy Spirit came upon individuals in the Old Testament as well. So experiencing God today uh, is, is through the work of the Holy Spirit. But in the Old Testament, there was only a select group of people that actually experienced the Holy Spirit in their lives. And they were often kings or prophets. Those were the people who were endowed with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so today, we're going to look at the story of Samuel as he goes to Bethlehem to look for the next king of the Israelites. And he's going to look among the sons of Jesse. And as we do, we're going to be confronted with the reality that, that honestly change is hard. Change is something that we all struggle with. It's not easy to let go of things of our past. But at the same time, we're going to see that God also looks deeply at who we are on the inside. And that the same Holy Spirit that is at work in our lives today was at work in the lives of the people in the past as well. Let's take a moment to pray to center our lives and our hearts this morning on Christ. Holy God, we are so grateful for the opportunity to be in this place. Lord God, I ask that you would be with us on this Father's Day. To come into this house of worship, to let your Holy Spirit descend on us so that we can come to experience you more this day. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. So sometimes in life, the music keeps playing. Sometimes in life, it's really hard to let go. I just leave it at that. Sometimes it's really hard to say, I'm done with this. You know, I struggle with this in my life. Um, and I'm sure many of you here today also struggle with letting go of things of our past. It's, it's hard to let go of something that you've had in your life for a long time. Often for me, it takes an intentional effort to, to purge that junk from my life and to get to clear up the useless stuff that I've held on to for so long. But when I think about holding on to things and keeping my traditions and my rituals intact, I often think about how I prepare for deer hunting. Because deer hunting is like my favorite hobby. And so like it's kind of like you know the lucky rabbit's foot uh, you know, idea or the special socks you wear to every game when you play sports. There are, there are certain things that we do that are just so hard to let go of. And when I think about letting go of the past, and I think about letting go of traditions, I can think of nothing better than one of my favorite movies in the entire world. Let's take a look at this video clip to get us started this morning. Let's have a pasty, eh? Shasties. Mom made the best pasties, remember? Remember how Ma used to make them? Nobody built a pasty like your mother. Yeah, they were so know. good I could almost eat six of them. <laughs> we ain't having pasties this year. We ain't what? I don't know. Thought we might eat something different. Not at deer camp. Deer camp, we eat pasties. Well, you know, I just thought it might change our luck if we ate something else. My luck's just fine the way it is, thank you very much. Speak for yourself, eh? I do believe I was, eh? No shesties. 
Let me remind you, eh? That pasties have been the traditional meal of choice since Great Grandpa Alphonse first built this camp. Change is good. Reuben, listen to me. We've known each other since we was kids. We're brothers, Remner. Hear me out. You know how I can be a little bit superstitious. <laughs> Any change in my dear camp ritual, big or small, directly deflects the odds of me bagging the big buck. Every year I pack up my truck the same way. I arrive at camp at the same time. I wake up open and morning at the same time. 4.44 a.m. on the dot. I go to the same blind, by way of the same route, with the same gun, the same buck calls, and the same spam and mayonnaise on bunny bread sandwich. Everything is exactly the same. Even the shirt on my back. I've worn the same shirt every opening day since the age of nine. Does it fit? No. Does it keep me warm? No. Does it smell? Most definitely. But does it guarantee the big buck for yours truly? You betcha. Why? Because it's part of Remnar Sodi's deer camp ritual. A ritual that includes eating pasties. You want to know what happens every time I eat pasties at deer camp? No. Nothing. Three decades of meat, potatoes, rutabagas, and lard. Every year, I go out to my blind, and I'm sitting out there waiting for first light, and the only sound I hear is the sound of myself farting like a tuba at the back of the band. Pasties is a Saudi tradition. I know that very much. But I got a vision, too, Remnar. A real one. Pasties are a Saudi tradition. Anybody else big fan of Eskenaz and the Moon Lions? I watch it every, every year. November 14th and 15th, sometimes the 16th as well. Remnar's deer camp tradition does it do any good? No, but does guarantee that I bag the big buck? Most definitely. That's the thing about traditions. Um, once we start putting together a process or a ritual around something, it becomes a tradition. It becomes something that we do to prepare for an expected ending. And while this video clip is a comedy movie about deer, deer hunting, what the character Remnar expresses is the same attitude that we as people of faith express when somebody threatens to challenge our spiritual traditions. Something as simple as changing a meal at deer camp can throw everything out of whack for the deer hunter. Now, does it really matter? No, you have to eat something. But does it cause a psychological response? Most definitely. So, what's the problem with change? Well, the problem with change is the fear that it instills in us as we move away from what we know to what we don't know. And as people of faith, whether, whether you've been in church for, for a day or a year or your entire lifetime, from day one in the church, we start establishing rituals around our experience of God. Worship in and of itself is a, a ritual. It has parts that have a flow with the express intention of creating a space where we can encounter the Holy Spirit of God. And when someone poses a change to that system, we often respond by being just defensive of the established ritual, of the established tradition in the church. You know, I read a story once, I don't know if I've shared this story with you or not before, but I read a story once about a pastor who was appointed to a church, and, and in this church it was it was more traditional uh, of a church, and so every, uh, after the pastoral prayer, the congregation said the Lord's Prayer. And so the, the pastor was there on her first Sunday, and they, she got done with the Lord's Prayer as she did, as, no, I'm sorry, the pastoral prayer, and as she did, the whole congregation stood up, turned around, faced the back, and said the Lord's Prayer. And when it was over, they all turned around and sat back down. The pastor was a little bit stunned. She didn't really understand. She didn't know what to think about that. And, and the next week, at the end of the pastoral prayer, again, the whole congregation stood up, turned around, said the Lord's Prayer, and then sat back down again. So this went on for a few weeks until finally she worked up the courage to ask the congregation why they stood up and turned around when they said the Lord's Prayer. And after a few minutes of that awkward silence, um, an elderly woman raised her hand and said that the Lord's Prayer used to be written on the back wall. 
It was tradition. It wasn't there anymore. It hadn't been for decades. But it was tradition. Throughout the history of faith and throughout Scripture, God uses different people and different experiences to convey his love, his mercy, and his grace to the people of God. But things, the fact is, is things change over time. And what do you do when God changes direction? Because Scripture tells us repeatedly that God influence us, uh, influences us in new and different ways throughout history. And I'm not saying that the basic tenets of God and the basic tenets of faith change over time. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that Jesus himself said, because Jesus himself said, I didn't come to abolish the law of Moses, but to see them fulfilled through me. So no, I, I'm not saying that there are things that, that change throughout Scripture. What I'm saying is that when something no longer serves a purpose, God goes in a new way. And we find this in Scripture repeatedly, that the experiences of the Holy Spirit utilize new means and expressions throughout time. And so we're going to look at the story of the starting of David's journey to become king. It's in 1 Samuel. Coming out of the time of Judges, you know, we spent some time looking at the Judges a few weeks, a month ago. So coming directly out of that time, when Israel had no king, uh, God's people said, give us a king. We need an earthly king. And they gave them Saul. And Saul became the king. But when Saul went against God's will in the world, something changed. So Saul was no longer favored by God. And you would think that God would just dethrone Saul and appoint someone else. But he doesn't. Saul loses favor with God but remains in power as king, which is a very interesting fact that those of us who like to say God appoints leaders fail to recognize that God appointed Saul and that God didn't like Saul anymore and God regretted that Saul was king, but he still was king and in power. At any rate, Samuel, the prophet of God, is caught in a place where we find ourselves a lot of times in our lives. Samuel anointed Saul to be king on God's instructions. Samuel was the guy who said, this is Saul, this is your king. But Saul was no longer fit to be king. And so if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to join me in the Old Testament in the book of 1 Samuel. And we're going to start at the end of chapter 15 and pick up the story there. So 1 Samuel 15, starting in verse 34, we find... The beginning of David's story. Then Samuel left for Ramah. But Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until that, until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again. Though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? Since I have rejected him as king over Israel, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take the heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I It's really hard to let go of something that you have invested, that you've invested in, spiritually invested in, emotional energy invested in. Samuel had invested in Saul. But God was done with Saul. How many times have we invested in our personal lives or in the lives of, the, of our church and something that God has led us into, but at some point becomes no longer useful to the building of the kingdom. And we step back and look at that thing, and we say, we can't quit doing this. We can't quit doing this because God called us to do this. But what God is telling Samuel is that to everything there's a season and a time and a place. God uses things for his will in this, on this earth 
But that doesn't mean that that thing or that ritual is meant to exist forever. Jesus tells us in John's Gospel that some things that grow from the vine, that is Christ, if they don't bear fruit, they should be pruned off the vine. Only the things that bear fruit should remain. I remember when I was a kid growing up in this church, and we used to heavily invest in a mission called Crop Walk. Anybody remember Crop Walk? That was like a big deal for us as a church. But at some point, it stopped producing fruit for us. Not for the world, but for us as a church. And as it did, it stopped being a missional working of our church. Now, did that make people mad? Yes, it did. It did, of course. Are there still people today who, now that I mention it, are thinking, we could start that back up again? I'm sure there are. I bet you that by this time next week, someone is going to come up to me and ask me if we can start doing crop walk again. Letting go of what God is no longer using in our church and in our lives in Christ is hard to do. We don't like doing it, nor do we want to. Because it was a way that we expressed our faith. It was a way that we experienced Christ in our lives in the world. But that, if that experience no longer serves the will of God in the world, then according to Jesus Christ himself, it should be cut off from the vine and thrown into the fire. The areas in our lives and the areas in our mission of our church that don't produce fruit should be cut off. So that the areas in our lives and the areas of our church mission that do produce fruit can flourish. Samuel was struggling with this. This issue right here is exactly what Samuel was struggling with. God had used Saul. God had called Saul. Saul was God's instrument. But Saul messed up his relationship with God. And now God regretted making Saul king. But to Samuel, Saul was still an important part of what God was doing in the world. And so the scripture tells us that Samuel mourned. He mourned for Saul. And God said to go to Jesse, anoint a new king. But to do that, Samuel had to go through Saul's homeland. And there were a lot of politics involved in this. If a, because here's the deal. If a prophet shows up at your house, if a prophet shows up in your village, it usually meant that they had a message from God about how you screwed up and you needed to fix things. And so... Having the prophet come to your house or your community was not necessarily a good thing. So God tells Samuel to go to Jesse with kind of in a ruse, present a sacrifice to God. That way nobody gets worried that, that they're in trouble. And in that way, Jesse and his family wouldn't be in fear of Samuel coming to Bethlehem. So let's pick up the story in verse 4. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And when they arrived, Samuel saw Eli and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then as he called Abibinad, Abibinad, yeah, we'll go with that one, and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then called, Shem, pass by. But Sam, Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. 
Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. So Samuel listens to the will of God. And he makes this trip to Bethlehem. And as expected, the elders in the town are afraid. They're afraid because the prophet coming to the town meant that you were going to probably be reprimanded for something that you were doing wrong, which is why there was fear and trembling, why they were afraid that Samuel was coming. But Samuel says he's going to present a sacrifice. He called Jesse to be present with his sons. So now, okay, it's great. We're not in trouble. And when the firstborn of Jesse comes before Samuel, Samuel says, yes, this is the guy. This is the guy that God's going to want. He looks like a king. He's tall. He's strong. A man that can serve like the judges serve. <laughs> Leading armies for God. A man who could step behind Saul and take over. The perfect worldly successor for a godly king. But that's not how God works. It never was, and it, and it still isn't. One of the most well-known phrases in the Old Testament presents itself here, but the Lord does not consider appearance. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Samuel was looking for someone who could play the part of a king. And God was looking for a person who could live the part of the king of God's people. Like Samuel, often we are so impressed, so impressed by the things that we see in this world, and less impressed by the spiritual depth that we have. Because God doesn't judge us by the way we look. And if we look at the part of a Christian, if we look like we're playing the part of an authentic person of faith, great. But it doesn't matter. God looks at the heart. And we may be able to fool the rest of the world into thinking that we're something that we're not. But we can't fool God. The depth of faith, the inward qualities of faith, and the character of Christ within us, these are the things that God looks at in his people. And I believe Jesus used the term um, whitewashed tombs. To describe those who, who didn't live into them, who were beautiful in their appearance on the outside, but morally and spiritually corrupt on the inside. Because God, God judges on us on the inside. So this progression continues, and none of Jesse's sons are accepted by Samuel. So Samuel asks directly, Are there any more? Just one, Jesse says, a shepherd boy who would grow to be a shepherd king. And David is presented, and Saul anoints him, and, and you would think that this would be the beginning of this great success story of this man who's, who's anointed in that moment. But it would take another 17 chapters in Exodus, and years before David would actually become king. There would be battles, there would be alliances, there would be politics, and they would all come to bear before this boy David would ascend to the throne. But something very important happens in this passage, something that draws this story into our understanding of Pentecost and the working of the Holy Spirit in this world. So let's, let's look one more time at verse 13, the last verse that we looked at. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And when we talk about the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, we often just assume this, that it's the age that we live in now with the Holy Spirit, and that it's only a New Testament and after kind of thing. But the fact remains that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, has been present with humankind from the very beginning. It just wasn't available to everyone. In the Old Testament, before the time, and before this time, in the time of Jesse, the Holy Spirit mainly came to kings and prophets. The people of God didn't live 
with the power of the Holy Spirit in them. Prophets and kings do. They live with the Holy Spirit in them. But for everyone else, their experience of God was directly related to their covenant, their rituals, their ritualistic sacrifices, and the encounters that they had with prophets and kings. There was this distance between people and God. There was there's this gap between people and God that stood in place. Jesus told his disciples in the Gospel of John that someone was coming after him, a, a comforter, the, an advocate, a spirit of truth that would walk with them and strengthen them until he returned. And after Jesus' death and resurrection, the Holy Spirit comes and, and is that and comes upon the disciples. The same Holy Spirit that came upon David and directed his life came to the disciples. And then for the first time in history, in Pentecost, the Holy Spirit of God, the living breath of God, was not just something that the kings and prophets experienced, but it was something that everyone was able to experience when they committed their lives to Christ and lived into the ways of God. Paul says that in Acts, in Acts uh, 2, he says, or Peter says, Peter replies, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. This is the new age that we live in, this era of Pentecost. It's a time where, like David, the least of us, to the greatest of us, are measured not by what the world sees, but what, what, what God, by what God sees. And like David, the least among us, understand, David was not even invited to the party, receives the gift of the Holy Spirit there's a purpose for that gift, and it's, it's quite simple. I talk about it all the time, to bring, and it's to bring about the kingdom of God in our world, to set the stage for the time when Jesus returns. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 12, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. That's the purpose, for the common good. So when, so when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, it comes upon us for a reason. Ooh. Making progress, right? Where does that leave us today? I think it leaves us with some very important realities that we have to kind of take from this text and pull into our lives. And the first thing that we see is very simply that God calls the least likely people. From a human point of view, David was not even worth inviting to. He was a nobody. He was the youngest son. But God saw in him, in him the qualities needed to be the next king of God's people. And it's easy for us to think that we are not qualified because of the way the world sees us. It's easy to see that. But Scripture tells us repeatedly that God does not look at us the same way that everyone else does. God looks at the heart, who you are on the inside. It's not just a saying to make you feel better. It's a biblical truth that who we are at our core, our character, matters more than what the people around us see. Because God calls the least likely, and God calls all of us. The second thing that we need to pull out of this is that some traditions are best left behind us. It is exceptionally hard to let go of something that we have done for a long time. Especially when that something means, was a means of experiencing God in our lives. But scripture shows us and directs us that when a ritual or tradition that we do no longer bears fruit, it's time to cut it off, thank God for it, and move on. This church will not be the same as it was 25 years ago. 25 years ago on Easter Sunday when we moved in, and 24 years ago on Easter Sunday when we moved into this building for the first service. We will not be the same church as we were then. We can't be. The church will never be the same as it was in the 80s and 90s when we worshiped in both buildings every other month. It's not going to happen. We won't be that church anymore. Ministries of the past that served us well in their time won't come back just because we miss them. What we do as a church must focus on one thing 
And one thing only, does it bear fruit? In the same way, the faith that we have in our youth will never be the faith that we have today. The things that worked for us in the past, the experience God, may change over time. They develop, they grow, they deepen, because they have to. When we use a tool or a resource, and we use it until it no longer works, then it's time to get a new tool. Or else one day, we're going to find ourselves turning around to the back wall of the worship center and saying the Lord's Prayer to a blank wall. Because it's been printed there for decades. Some traditions are hard to let go of, but if we're going to grow with God, we need to be ready to let go of what doesn't work anymore and move on to something that does. Our third thing that we can pull from Daniel's story here is that the Holy Spirit is ours. Unlike the kings and prophets of the Old Testament, each one of us, every single one of us, when we profess and give our lives to Christ, when we truly repent and step into a life of Christ, the Holy Spirit comes upon us, guides us, and directs us. And like anything else in this world, we have to be receptive to that, and we have to be committed to Christ. And when we are, the Holy Spirit resides within us, guides us, and works through us, the living breath of God expressed in our works and in our lives. And those things are, as I said last week, Paul calls them out in Galatians 5. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against those things, there is no law. That's what we should be seeing in our lives. We walk in the Spirit, we trust in Christ, and we live into the character traits of Christ that God calls us. Holy God, we are grateful that you would love us enough to send your Son into this world and die for us. God, we ask that you would continue to work in and through us to help us to see and recognize the character traits in ourselves that you see in us. Lord God, be present in our lives. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. We're not simply dismissed from this place, but we're called to go into the world. And so we come to the church one way, and if we've experienced God, we should be leaving in a new way. And so this week, I call you to, to some next steps. First thing, to be called. I want you to think about over this week, how has God called you in your life? I want you to write down your calling statement. How has God called you in life? Just jot it down. Articulate and detail what God has called you to do. Second thing is to remember the Christ-like character building that we need to have. When God looks at your heart, do a little reflection. What does God see? What does God see in your heart? Identify one character trait that you think doesn't appease God. And then work on it. Work on eliminating it from your life. And lastly, let go of the past. I want you to think about your spiritual life, your spiritual traditions, your rituals that you used in the past that don't seem to work anymore, don't seem to bear fruit in your spiritual life. And I want you to pray over that tradition, pray over that ritual, praise God that it worked for so long, and then let it go. Give thanks to God and let go. Now, before we dismiss, let's hear these words that God gave to Moses, that Moses gave to Aaron, that Aaron gave to his sons to give to the people of Israel. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Go this day in God's peace. Amen.